great nation will endure as it has endured, will revive and will prosper. And these United States have revived and prospered, growing through the years to the greatest democracy in the world. Led by one of its citizens, chosen by its people from the farms, from the towns, from the cities, each vote asserts the constitutional rights of a free people. In the first moving pictures ever to record a presidential inauguration, here is William McKinley as he becomes the 25th president of the United States. Although he was a great advocate of national preparedness and peace, it was during his administration that the shocking news from Admiral Dewey of the sinking of the Maine in Havana Harbor in 1897 stirred the American people to declare war on Spain and crush her in three short months, thus liberating oppressed Cuba. During this campaign, there rose to prominence Theodore Roosevelt and his famous Rough Riders. He was elected to the vice presidency in 1900 in McKinley's second term. And a few months later, when McKinley was assassinated at the Pan American Exposition in Buffalo, he became the chief executive. In 1904, Theodore Roosevelt was re-elected president. His restlessness and modern energy enabled him to direct the successful construction of the Panama Canal, so vital to our two ocean defense, after France and Spain abandoned the task as hopeless. Outstanding in Roosevelt's administration was the great conservation program for our national resources. Huge tracts of land were set aside for national parks, which we know today as the tourist centers of unexcelled beauty. In 1908, William Howard Taft was elected president. He was not so strenuously progressive as Roosevelt. However, during his administration, the Postal Savings Bank was created and Parcel Post inaugurated. This was a new departure for the government in competing with private industry, banking, and express. Woodrow Wilson's inauguration on the 4th of March, 1913, followed his election when Roosevelt split with Taft and formed the Progressive Republican Party, which was known to us all as the Bull Moose Party. His administration faced rumblings of war in Europe, which threatened the peace of the world. And as the great nations of Europe were in the death throes of battle, in 1916, he was re-elected on the slogan, he kept us out of war. And just five months later, after Germany had declared unrestricted submarine warfare, we were involved in the First World War. Woodrow Wilson signs the declaration of war on Germany, and War Secretary Newton D. Baker draws the first draft ballot. From every rank and file, young America joins the fight for democracy. Then came the glorious days of armistice. With flags flying and bands playing, the victorious army returns to its homeland. To present his far-sighted 14 points, Woodrow Wilson sailed for Paris. The big four, Lloyd George, Clemenceau, Orlando, and Woodrow Wilson, discussed the fate of their fallen foes. But at the signing of the treaty at Versailles, Woodrow Wilson failed to achieve his dream for lasting peace. He returned home a bitterly disillusioned man and finished his term of office broken in health and spirit. March 4, 1921, Warren G. Harding took the oath of office as the 29th president and the keynote of his inaugural address was back to normalcy after the hectic World War days. Prohibition was established in 1921 and as the nation went dry, the era of bootleggers, speakeasies, and gangster warfare began. One of the highlights of the Harding administration was the famous arms conference. Millions of dollars of unfinished warships were scrapped 
in an attempt to create world peace. Warren G. Harding died suddenly in the summer of 1932 in the midst of national scandal. A few hours after the news of Harding's death, Calvin Coolidge was summoned from the hills of Vermont and took the oath of office as President of the United States from his father, a Justice of the Peace in Plymouth. Farms prospered, factories hung, and subsidy was given shipping by means of profitable mail contracts. And Coolidge's administration became an era of heretofore unseen prosperity. After Coolidge's famous, I do not choose to run, Herbert Hoover succeeded him on March 4th, 1929. And by autumn of that year, the Coolidge boom market exploded. The stock market crashed, an economic crisis followed. Unemployment increased, and the country sank to the depths of the greatest depression in its history. And as ever, the people looked to Washington to restore order and prosperity. Franklin Delano Roosevelt was elected in 1932, and during a wild panic of bank runs and strikes, on the very day of his inauguration, Roosevelt closed all the banks in the country under an old statute bill. And then repealed. In 1936, Roosevelt was re-elected by the largest electoral majority in history. He faced four years with many problems. Neutrality. National defense. Disasters. Farming. Water power. Social security. Gold, keeping the American dollar the soundest in the world. Unemployment, WPA providing for the jobless until they could be absorbed in private industry. In 1939, the shadow of Hitler's swastika appeared on the horizon to extinguish the light of Europe's democracies. Together with his accomplice, Benito Mussolini, they threatened the freedom of the whole world. Back in the United States, in the cities, mines, mills, factories, and on the farms, America united in the greatest peacetime defense program in all its history and elected Franklin Delano Roosevelt to a third term, its first third term president. And as long as the United States of America enjoys the freedom of its great democracy, Mr. President will come and go. The choice of people, by the people, and